our last and very special keynote for the summit, creating business value through IT innovations. <clears throat> the whole purpose of digital transformation is to make businesses more agile, more competitive. Our speaker for this keynote is David Pinto, Global Head of Security and Network of a leading pharmaceutical company, Boringer. Boringer has over 50,000 employees, based uh, headquarters based in Europe, but pretty global presence. Without further ado, I'll invite David on the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. So I was just wanted to take a look to see how many people we actually had coming back after lunch here as we, as we wrapped up. It was good, good crowd. So my name is David. I wanted to talk to you about our transformation, right? About, um, about what we've been doing at, uh, at Behringer. But I also have some, some experiences with transformation in, in, the, in the recent months as I've moved my family uh, from the U.S. to Europe. I've been, we've been going through cultural uh, transformations. I'm now based in Spain. And you can imagine trying to get used to eating dinner at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> is, uh, is, is quite a bit of a challenge that we're working our, our way through at the moment right now. Um, this event has is, is been pretty transforming for me as well. Usually I'm on that side. Of, of the stage, and so I'm not usually talking to a large group of people like this. Um, but a couple months back when, when Jay called me and we were talking, and we were talking about what we've been working through at, at BI and what I saw in the industry and where we're heading, uh, he asked me, hey Dave, would you, would you like to tell this story at Zenith Live? And I said, Jay, what, what's involved here? What's, you know, what do we need to do to do this? It sounds interesting. He said, you'd come up, you could do a small little breakout session for a group of you know, 10, 15 executives, or you can go on stage and you can do something maybe a little bit larger. I said, Let, well, let's start small. Let me check. Let's start small. I'll do a breakout, and, uh, and I'll get back to you, right? Because uh, we also have to get some clearance and things like that. So I got back, and then lo and behold, a couple weeks before the show, I find out, okay, no, we're, we're going to be doing a keynote. So instant transformation, right? And, and it's either you, you make it or you don't make it. Um, and, and I really I jumped on the opportunity because I want to get a chance to tell our story in, in a wider audience and, and also interact with you guys. Um, a little bit about uh, Behringer. We uh, founded in 1885, global pharmaceutical company, privately held still to this day. We work in, in three main spaces, in the human pharma sector, in the animal health sector, and also in biopharmaceuticals. We're comprised of about 50,000 employees worldwide. And on the right-hand side there, you'll see, in addition to that, we have about 15 to 20,000 contractors accessing our services or working with us at any point in time. We're located in 70 countries in about 230 actual locations where, where we have network connectivity, WAN connectivity. And we've got thereabouts 3,000 applications, and I think like the other speakers, right, those are the ones we know about and we track. So for us, what's driving the transformation, right? When we talk about transformation and we talk about digitization, what does that mean to our company? What does that mean for us within IT in our company? We have the mantra also, cloud first, right? We have... Um, uh, the, the, the digital workspace that we're bringing, where we talk about um, being able to access our applications, our systems, and collaborate from anywhere, at any time, right, on any device. So we have these, and, and really now we're, we're looking to, to live them. Uh, you'll see some of the services that we, we've been using here. Uh, Salesforce, Viva on top of Salesforce, uh, AWS, starting to get a footprint also into Azure. Um, and, and other services within Microsoft, and we're starting also to get into the development world a bit. Traditionally, we're 
and off the shelf. We buy products, we customize, do a little bit of reporting, but, but now we're starting to, to move that uh, more into development in-house as well. So for us, and for my team in the network and security, as we start to see this happening, right, and, and we're working with our different business units to understand, you know, how will the network change? These are the, some of the topics that, that we're looking to address. What, what is that gonna mean? What, is, what are these applications and the uses, use of these applications going to do from our network footprint? Okay. These were some of the things that I was concerned about and I was hearing, right? So, of course, on the network, we, MPLS, lower bandwidth, uh, we, were pr we were pretty tight trying to run our requirements and understand the bandwidth needs. Um, so oftentimes we were running at 80% plus uh, from, a, from a utilization perspective, uh, utilizing QoS, but at the times when you're, you're fully pegged, even QoS doesn't work for you, right? So we had complaints uh, uh, about uh, whether it be browsing or, or Skype or, or any of that. Uh, we are always on the need and looking out for uh, how we get better at security. And for me, I'm, I'm tired of rolling out hardware in, in all the, the countries that we have presence in. It's a logistic nightmare. And if any of you are, are also doing this, I mean, we have to do it still for some of our appliances um, when, it, when it comes to the, the edge node, right? Uh, but, but if we don't have to, we're really pushing virtual. We're pushing virtual or looking at cloud-based services. So when it comes down to the ZIA in the proxy environment, um, we took a look at the, the players in the market, uh, some, of, some of Zscalers also, their, their uh, competitors, and uh, we, we did some testing and it turned out for us that Z, Zscaler was the right fit, right? Cloud-based service, we can turn it up with some software configuration um, and, and we're, we're really happy with it. I want to continue to talk about what the transformation can feel like. And, um, you know, as I watched the, the keynotes from, from the other sessions, I started to chuckle, right? Who, who, uh, who sees the key theme throughout this uh, Zscaler? Yeah? What is it? The wave, the sea, right? Sailboats. I saw the sailboat yesterday and I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so. I mean, my analogy, I think, is also a bit different. It's, yes, of course, there's a sea and there's waves, and that brings some change. But for me, transformation has a lot to do with the seas you're in, right? And it depends where you're at as a company, uh, where, where you happen to be heading, what are the environmental forces or factors that are applying pressure to you. Right? What does your organization look like? What does your team look like? And what are those skills and capabilities that you bring? So when I look at these three pictures here, to me, they show very different, uh, very different aspects of what a transformation can feel like. In the middle there, I see a team working together, hiked out on the edge of the sailboat, right? As that sailboat's got a nice heel because there's some forces that are being applied to it, the wind, uh, and you can really pick up speed when you're doing that correctly, right? And this is where I also see Zscaler. Zscaler's out on the forefront. They saw some of this. They're, they're working like this team over here. Or you can be on the other side where the environment's applying the pressure to you. You're not really exactly sure what to do or you might have a big wave coming at you. Um, and and really, it really depends on your situation and what you're doing to be prepared. For us, what did those seas look like was not so much the technology I'm talking to you about today. It was a, a huge acquisition, merger, business swap. And I actually have a colleague here from, from Sanofi where we, uh, where we worked this deal out with, where we um, swapped assets, 
with a little bit of money, I think, on top of that, that we gave you, right? Um, <clears throat> and we took over the animal health business of Sanofi, and we handed off our OTC business. For us, what did this mean? I had a team of people working on the integration of over 27 locations at the same time, right? Bringing them onto the BI network, buying equipment, uh, doing, looking at the facilities, bringing in new lease lines, all these, all these kind of things. And then, oh, by the way, we happen to happen to be in the end of life for our proxy environment. So that, that was the battle for us, right? Making the room for the innovation, working through this huge uh, deal, this merger and this acquisition, and at the same time additional divestitures because of um, FTC requirements. That's, that's where our focus was. But thankfully, because we had done some early work, we knew about Zscaler, we were able to quickly position a project to roll out this to our end users and, and, and do it pretty quickly. I wanted to show you, and I wanted to get a little bit more tactical over here to kind of show you what a project looks like for potentially for a size of about 50, 55,000 users. Now, what you don't see here is the earlier part of the year where uh, we learned within our team about Zscaler and we did a quick production pilot, right? You heard from some of the other speakers where they talk about it's important to make that partnership within the business, find someone who can be your, your champion. Our someone happened to be our business unit in South Africa, right? One of the locations that are pretty far away. And then when you have to come back, you experience, they were happy to try anything we threw at them, All right? So we rolled out Zscaler to South Africa, immediately got good feedback, good results, helped us, helped inform us on how we needed to do the larger program. Signed the contract towards the end of June. I've also come to learn here as part of uh, my cultural transformation what happens in July, August. It's a little difficult to, to, to get some work done as everybody's uh, you know, enjoying vacation time, which is also something I'm looking forward to do in the next years. Um, and then we really kicked it off in September. And from September through the end of November, we rolled this out globally, including all the change controls, all the communications, everything that, that uh, had to do with it. And what I'm going to do now is bring up my lead engineer, who's going to talk to you about the before and after architecture. So, Gustavo, why don't you come on out? Gustavo Kowiansky is responsible for the service, the Zscaler service in our organization, and he's going to give you a breakdown of what our architecture looks like. Thanks, David. Well, actually, the transformation is also here for me. This is my first time doing this in front of my senior manager, so I hope to do it well. Um, I was on the last event um, in Las Vegas from Zscaler. Actually, I really enjoyed it. It was amazing. And uh, from a network engineer perspective, there was a moment that I wanted to see how to connect the dots. You know, all these things are awesome, but actually, how can I use it? So our, our idea with these slides is to, you know, just compare the most important differences between our topologies, before and after. And um, we can recognize them on a quick view, since we are talking about a solution on-premise, with hardware inside. And for sure, if we are talking about equipment, we are talking about redundancy, high availability. And with that, double risk. You have to think about the logistic, in case you need to send some boxes. And for sure, you're going to need people on-site to deploy the equipment, install it, even support for it. No secrets, everything that came with a physical appliance is going to be there. So on that topology, we had consolidated internet access on six locations in a kind of 
proxy chain in architecture with downstream proxy and upstream segment. Actually, at the peak, this infrastructure took more than 80 servers throughout the globe. But how does a user to surf into the internet using that topology? Well, we'll try to not get too technical, but our, our user machines were pointing to a downstream proxy using a pack file controlled by a GPO in Active Directory. And the traffic blocks f was flowing between the downstream server and the upstream segment. So what about those countries that are too far from the hosting side? You can imagine the latency there. So let me give you a quick example. I am from Argentina. I'm based there. Is actually where I do most of the time. And the latency that we got from Argentina to North America is more than 150 milliseconds. So in case that I need to go to a specific website via internet, I have to count that, la that, that latency. So let's check with the, with the new solution using Cscaler. And this is where the local breakouts bring the magic, at least for us. The first difference was that there was no additional hardware needed. We are still using our MPLS, so we are able to use the same equipment. With um, this solution, where we got the chance to use direct internet access, we were able to create our own GRE tunnels directly to Cscaler. We are now managing you know, the public IP addresses anymore since Cscaler is taking care of it, which is really good. We were not able to do that on the previous design. And about the configuration, we didn't add any complexity to the network. We just needed three different things. We needed to configure the GRE tunnel, which is really simple. We also use a PVR, a policy-based router, because there is a moment that you need to decide. I mean, the, this traffic is still going through the MPLS, maybe audio, video, whatever. And this traffic is going to be through the Cscaler connection. And we also use an IP SLA and track and kind of float and route for the you know, routing table. So many of you know that the SLA mechanism, what we are going to do with that is that it allows us to you know, choose which is the best way that we must um, connect to Cscaler. So in case that there is a one issue, and the RTT increase a little bit, the SLA will react, and we are able to swap to another connection and choose the best way to go to the send node. We are also using a pack file here you know, so to recognize which is the subnet network and the region. And we also use the pack file for those companies that are asking us to do some white listing. So maybe they are asking us for a specific, for a specific source IP, and we are using our vSense, actually we got six of them around the globe, to forward the traffic using the pack file and hard code our source IP in order to be compliant with them. We are also able to perform some fallback here, so in case that the internet is down, we are able to use the PBR and forward the traffic using our MPLS. In our hosting side, we got four GRE tunnels with the lowest RTT due to proximity to Cscaler. So let's talk about the user experience now. As I mentioned, I'm from Argentina. And what about if I need to have access to a, to a specific website located in the same region? Now there is no need to go to North America to reach that specific site. The traffic is not going to be bouncing between continents because we are able to create our own GRE tunnels to see scalar directly, as mentioned. But the thing is that since this scaler is almost everywhere, we were able to connect to them because they have send nodes on the same region. So we have decreased the latency from 150 milliseconds to 45 or 50 milliseconds. So I can say that it was a really an improvement on the network and the end user experience. All of this is done using just one platform. So there is no need to go to a specific server to change something on the pack file. 
or maybe there is some issues. There are some issues syncing the policies and permissions and rules between the you know downstream and upstream segment. We are doing everything from just one platform. We have all the rules, policies, all our GRE tunnels, all our locations just in one side. So let's see the results using this topology. Thanks, Gustavo. So, what were the end results for us? Um, better end user experience, as you can see from, from Gustavo's, uh, Gustavo's commentary here. Uh, and, and he's actually in Argentina, so he, he speaks uh, from living it. At the same time, we use some of the browser uh, built-in tools and testing frameworks um, to really automate some of that, right? And, and tell us with facts uh, that shows that the Zscaler uh, breakout was, was working better. So it was, it's, it's important for us to have both, right? Um, we also got a lot of benefits from the enhanced SSL inspection that we were able to turn up. Uh, and I'll talk to you also a little bit about what we what, what you need to look out for within the project. But uh, we were quickly able to turn up more SSL inspection services uh, to improve the security. Yeah, about the analytics, uh, there was also a change due to the fact on the previous solution that we got to run a report could take many hours. So now everything is in the cloud. Just a few seconds, you are able to see the logs. So that was really a really big change. And as Gustavo already mentioned, uh, our previous environment at its peak had over 80 appliances, right? So when you talk about having to manage that, having to upgrade those, having to keep those running, uh, we don't have that challenge anymore. We <coughs> configure a GRI route out to the internet, out to Zscaler, and, and we go. Yeah? Um, so this really helped us improve on our operational efficiencies uh, and, and really reduce the overhead there so these guys can focus on other activities. What did we learn along the way? And I think you've also heard it here from the panel before. Start your conversations early when it comes to uh, security and privacy. Right, you got your works councils to deal with, GDPR, internal security groups. You gotta bring all these people to the table together and align on, on how you're gonna configure that. Um, because likely you won't turn up 100% SSL inspection, right? There'll be categories that you continue, and we also do it too, uh, that you continue to allow to flow through uh, for various reasons. Yeah, we had to also rethink the Active Directory architecture, since uh, we need to sync some groups that we are using actually with our policies in the Zscaler platform. And then the last one here we also have is what we call be wary of legacy apps. And it's really around the source IP and the whitelisting topic. We have a lot of business areas that over the course of time have contracted with external services and the external services say, okay, we wanna protect this connectivity somehow. Oh, by the way, here's our external addressing, right? So our, our, our addressing that we've registered is being used in who knows how many different locations to lock down that connectivity. And when you go with a service such as Zscaler, if you don't implement a local VZEN and some whitelisting and a different approach that, that continues to make use of your private addressing, that will break connectivity. The best thing you can do is have those conversations early and try to encourage the business to work with their partners to come up to something a little bit more up to date, um, but it's a challenge. Okay, so where are we going next? What are we gonna be focusing on next? Uh, we're currently in a phase two to, to get off uh, the, 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 the last of our legacy proxy environment. We're migrating some of our servers that still require internet access for either licensing purposes or, or whatever the case may be. So that's being completed this year. We're also focusing on looking at Zscaler to support us in some of our guest wireless access. Uh, we deploy that service ourselves uh, within, within BI throughout to our business units. Some certain business units um, from a legal perspective are challenged with using that approach. 
So we can also work Zscaler into that model uh, and, and provide a solution for them. And then finally, we're also looking at optimizing the user experience with bandwidth control. I think you saw on the earlier slide, we're in the midst of also transitioning and moving some of our service to Office 365. And for sure, we see this being uh, instrumental in supporting that. I mentioned digital workspace, the Office 365 initiative. In addition to the bandwidth control, we're going to be looking at Zscaler's advanced firewall capabilities once we start looking at taking other protocols out to the internet other than AD and 443, for example, VoIP. Um, this is something that we, we will also look to see if we can leverage in our branch offices. Yeah, and automation is, the, is one of the new magic words. And uh, our idea is to reduce the, the risk on the, for the human error for some changes. So for example, in case that a specific user needs to access to a, work, uh, to a website which is blocked. Uh, we do have our workflow tool to get the approval for that specific user. So when he gets the approval, there is an open, a ticket open, and our operational team is going to take it and do the modification. So the idea is to use some Python code, Cscaler API, to, that, to do that um, change automatically and try to avoid any errors. And then the last um, topic that I, I felt I wanted to, to share with you on what we're working on is uh, as we go through this digital transformation, we are also going through a cultural transformation within our organizations, and I suspect you are uh, too. Uh, our, our employees, our people, uh, we need to change our mindsets, change our skill sets. And here I wanted to mention, okay, we also need to change our internal service management capabilities. We're now focused more, and, and you heard it, uh, with our partners uh, who we trust to deliver the service. But of course, we, we need to come closer together. And a perfect example I have for you on just speaking the same language. Uh, I had one engineer who, uh, with, with an issue that we had recently, was talking to the account team and said, there's a problem with the SLA, with the IP SLA. He was talking technical. The account management team said he's got a problem with the SLA. Something happened. Let's go take a look at the contract, right? Worked out good for us because now, now we're getting the credit. But at the end of the day, it wasn't the same language, right? So one of the things I'm working on with our internal team is how do we improve that service management capability at the same time? And for sure, you need both. You need both technical and the software skills around the service management side of the house. Thank you for letting us share our story with you. If you have any questions or want to hear anything more about, uh, about ZIA or where we have experience with, please reach out to, to either myself or, or Gustavo. We'd be happy to, to share uh, more details with you. Okay, and with that being said, we'll turn it back over to Jay. <laughs>